Hi guys and welcome to episode 1 of Hearts of the North, the second chapter of Guild Wars Beyond. So in case you don't know, Guild Wars Beyond is essentially a series of free updates for players to continue playing the game that bridges the storyline between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2 and it's really cool and it's basically split into three different chapters. I've just finished Let's Playing the first chapter, The War in Kryta, and now we're moving on to chapter 2, The Hearts of the North. Now what we're looking at here is the official Guild Wars website with all the information that they released about Hearts of the North. This website went live just before the content went live in game as well and it's actually got a huge spoiler really in my opinion about what happens in the story here but at the end of the day ArenaNet did release this and they did kind of spoil it for all the players at the time anyway so instead of trying to censor it I'm just going to read it and we'll take it as it is and we'll go through Hearts of the North in full knowledge of what's about to happen. So at the start of episode 0 I read out that first little bit above Destined to be Together so now we'll read the rest of it. Hearts of the North is the next instalment of Guild Wars Beyond, an ongoing campaign that expands the Guild Wars storyline and lays the foundation for the upcoming Guild Wars 2. Following the events of the war in Kryta, Hearts of the North tells the historic story of the union of two of the greatest heroes of Asklon, Gwen and Kieran Thackeray. The Eben Vanguard came to the aid of the Shining Blade rebels during the Crichton Civil War, sending the valiant Lieutenant Kieran Thackeray and his elite Eben Falcons to train the insurgents. During the climax of the war, Kieran seemingly sacrificed his life to save civilians from the oppressive White Mantle, leaving Gwen, the woman he loves, to face another unbearable loss in her life. But Kieran Thackeray is very much alive, and he'll cut through an army of foes to reach his destiny. This series of quests and missions chronicles Kieran Thackeray's long odyssey to find himself and return home to his beloved, culminating in the wedding of Gwen and Kieran, but only if you help. You will search for clues to the whereabouts of the Lost Lieutenant and even play Kieran himself in a series of missions set in the aftermath of the War in Kryta. Only those who have finished the War in Kryta can access Hearts of the North. Once you have participated in Kieran's safe return, you can attend the wedding and associated festivities. For an overview of the War in Kryta, go here. So there you go, that's basically the background. Obviously there's a lot more to the Warring Cry ever, that's all we really need to know for this chapter. And yeah, it's basically told us a lot of what's coming up here. Hearts of the North isn't a very long chapter by any stretch of the imagination, but there you go, this was released. It's pretty cool, I like these little articles, and I really like the one that comes with the next chapter as well, The Winds of Change. So, uh, so yeah, let's go in game and kick this off, shall we? To give you an idea of just how short this is, everything in the Hearts of the North was added in pretty much a single update. There were actually two updates, to be honest, but there were the only reason there were two updates was that about halfway through the Winds of Change, when it first came out, there was... They say this was a bug. I'm not sure if it really was a bug or not. I, I mean, I, I don't expect the developers to have lied to us, but essentially there was a bug, or there was something that wasn't intended to be there in the middle of the storyline that essentially stopped people from being able to go any further than the first three missions or so so we were kind of stuck and then a few days later I believe the next update came out and we could finish it but essentially that's kind of what we're dealing with here it was a one update <laughs> if you watched me play through the war in Kryta, you'll know I talked about lots of little updates all the time they kind of surprised us with Hearts of the North I mean we knew it was coming but they did kind of surprise us and it was really really cool I think this was the first stuff that John Stummy did actually or was this just before John Stummy basically took over at the head of the live team in any case it is definitely very fun the stuff we'll be seeing here nonetheless so I'm, I'm quite looking forward to it. So in episode 0, we went out into the Hall of the Monuments and we spoke to Gwen. I, I'm not 100% sure. I'm pretty sure nothing will happen when we come back out, but I want to quickly check. Uh, we spoke to her and we found out all the even Falcons came back. They appointed her to be in charge up here in the uh, the far Shiver Peak. She's basically in charge of the entire even Vanguard now that Langmar's dead. Yeah, we found out Captain Langmar is dead. I, when, when I did episode 0, I kind of wanted to put on some sad music or something. I loved Langmar. That was so cool. And then they kind of just throw it at you at the start of Hearts of the North. They kind of throw a character death at you. You never really get much else out of her, sadly. I, I don't ever remember any characters referencing her, not even at this wedding, which we now know is happening. Uh, I don't think anyone really mentions her, unless I'm forgetting something quite obvious. But yeah, so uh, Gwen has now come to be in quite a powerful, quite an influential position within Ascalon, and that becomes really, really important with probably the most important thing about her character, which isn't actually explored yet, and it could be explored. If you guys watched my Winds of Change video the other day, 
say I, I mentioned this. Uh, the most real, really important thing about Gwen, as she'll later be known, Gwen Thackeray, is the fact that she ends up at Ebonhawk, the last bastion of human resistance in Ascalon for Guild Wars 2. She essentially fortifies that place and makes it the place that it is. And that's coming up with her, but Hearts of the North really isn't about that. That's kind of about, it's mostly about her meeting Thackeray, really, and it's all about them kind of being reunited. So, yeah, there's no dialogue here. I didn't think there was going to be. We can't even speak to her. I don't think she says anything, does she? No, just normal stuff. So, what do you do? Well, this was the, the other kind of cool thing about the win uh, Winds of Change. At the heart. And I'm probably going to do that a lot while I'm Let's Playing, by the way. I, I've been playing so much Winds of Change lately, I'm going to keep calling it Winds of Change. I get these two confused at the best of time. But yeah, this was one of the best things, really, I think, about the Hearts of the North that they ended up doing. They didn't just direct you from place to place to place. Some people didn't like it because it felt a little bit like finding a needle in the haystack and I kind of can't get that across because I'm let's playing it and I already know where to go. But you'll see, we kind of had the task, we knew that people would last been heard, we, we kind of knew that Langmar's grave was near the Giants Basin or the Lesser Giants Basin, we knew that Thackeray was around somewhere, but that was it and past that who the hell knew where to go? Nobody really did. So we had, I remember when the forums, when it came out and I was being on the forums, I remember everybody talking about looking all up in kind of this area of the Shiver Peaks, hoping something was going to happen in all kinds of different areas out in the uh, the Verdant Cascades as well, hoping that Kieran would be there. Turns out he's not anywhere around there. So the locations that ArenaNet picked, I think, for where you do find these things in Hearts of the North, aren't necessarily the most clever, but they do leave some clues. Like, for example, if you walk out here, you'll find an Even Vanguard scout here, who's not usually here. If you remember the first time we met Kieran, it was right out here, and now there's a scout here, so we can speak to him. And he says, Between you and me, I don't believe that Lieutenant Thackeray's dead. It's been too long since we've heard from him, but I haven't abandoned hope yet. We need to find him. I suggest we begin our search within Kryter. I know, we'll find something there. You know, I'm, I'm not sure that really the whole wedding thing or the fact... You know, the biggest spoiler, arguably, is... Oh, Kieran actually is alive, really? Oh, hold on, I didn't actually take in what he just said. What did he say? Oh, he just says within Kryter? Really? All right, well, they guide you to Kryter. <laughs> okay, yeah, a bit of a needle in a, in a haystack. What we're going to be doing is going up to Beetle Tun. I don't really know why you were supposed to know this. I think this was kind of one of those things where they decided to make do with as little resources as they could to extend the length of the story. So essentially they said, look, players can go around and look, and that's going to be a lot of content, a lot of time they're going to be playing the game to find these things. So in that way, they kind of artificially raise the amount of time it takes to play Hearts of the North, I guess. But I think it just frustrates most people. But yeah, the, the Kieran thing, arguably the biggest spoiler is, oh, hey, Kieran's actually alive. But then also, by the end of this video, we will all know that Kieran's alive. And I suppose it's kind of obvious. It's called Hearts of the North. It's all about Kieran and Gwen. He has to be alive it's not like he's going to be dead and it's all about Gwen moving on though that would have been quite cool I could have seen that if she if he died and then that was kind of how Gwen decided realized that she had to be a better person and that would have been a much more convincing story for me because as you know I don't really like Gwen that much but yeah so we're going to be coming out back in Kryter and checking out this Tengu here there aren't peacekeepers yes Kryter is actually saved and I think this is so cool when you have saved Kryter it goes back to normal it's really really cool all those extra mobs that were added all that kind of stuff is all gone and it really does feel quite good when we get to the winds of change I'll try not talk about winds of change too much but it's kind of buzzing around my head constantly at the moment simply because that's kind of the thing I've been playing a lot but when we do get to the winds of change you'll see they really take it up a notch with the winds of change with that in particular to do with the afflicted and stuff and uh, I, it's something that I do still enjoy about the war and cry I suppose one little nice thing would have been if they change the initial spawns here too as well. I can't, no, nowhere really springs to mind right now except perhaps some of these areas down, um, way down south so there's no reason really ever to come here. But you know, if you go to Riverside Province you can walk out of this portal here, right, to the Twin Serpent Lakes. This was an explorable area that had nothing to do with the Warring Cry as you know. Absolutely no content happened there at all. But down here there are loads of white mantle around and I think it would have been quite cool if once we'd completed the Warring Cry, uh, those kinds of white mantle mobs that were always around regardless of before the, the war in Cryo had started. If they were removed as well, that would have been even more awesome, but I guess not. You know, the, the White Mantle is supposed to exist come Guild Wars 2, so they are, there will be stragglers around. We kind of already talked about that in uh, Winds of Ch in the War in Cryo itself. See, I get these confused so much. Winds of Change, War in Cryo, Hearts of the North. They, they don't even sound similar. I just get them confused. It's ridiculous. So anyway, yeah, we're out here. Why, why the hell are we out here? Well, because if you come over onto this hill around this corner... You can actually find something. I think I f yes, yes, I can see something on my compass just over there. Pretty sure it's a yeah. There we go. You can find the embedded arrowhead. There are lots of these items. Essentially, they're kind of 
first part of the Hearts of the North storyline is wandering around Kryta trying to find clues about what may have happened to Kieran and what may have happened to Langmar. Well, you come out here, and I suppose this is a reasonable, pla reasonable place to look. I mean, you do have the Greater Giants base in there. I always was under the impression it was the Lesser Giants base, and just because we last saw them at the Ascon settlement, so I kind of thought, oh, right, okay, maybe it'll be around here, but maybe it is the Greater Giants base, and in any case, you can come to the Watchtower Coast, and obviously it's not going to be the Divinity Coast. Well, maybe it could have been the Divinity Coast. Can you still get in there? Can you get in through the secret lab after finishing the War in Cryer? I don't think you can. But anyway, if you come to the Watchtower Coast, quite near to the coast, you can actually find an embedded arrowhead. I think it would have been nice if it was closer to the beach, but whatever. We can have a look at it. And I think it actually, does it have a model? No, it doesn't, that's a shame. But you can have a look at it, and it says, An arrowhead lies embedded within the ground. Something about the unique shape of the arrowhead seems familiar, as though you've seen it used somewhere before. The ground shows signs of a conflict that took place here. Perhaps the scrying pool in the Eye of the North can help shed some light on what happened in the past. This is really cool. I like this. This is probably my favourite thing about the Hearts of the North, if I'm totally honest. So we'll say I'll get to the bottom of this. And now we've actually got a quest. You can go back to the Eye of the North. And I'm not sure what caused the live team to think to do this, but I think it was quite cool. Obviously, in the Eye of the North, we had the scrying pool. This ancient magic in this big place, which I now believe to be built by Jotun. If you've been watching the dungeon series, I read out one of the new blog post it was a Jotun blog t blog post and it just sounds so perfectly to be Jotun I think it's ancient Jotun magic here why the Jotun managed to create something that could see the great destroyer one of the champions of one of the elder dragons I don't know but it's still very cool but in eye of the north we did learn about the scrying pool and the scrying pool helped us a lot we wouldn't have really known about the central transfer or anywhere to go without it but we never really got much explanation about it and it never really got talked about much past that. However, come Guildhall's Beyond, they bring it back in, which I think is very cool considering what a mysterious, interesting object it is within the game. I mean, it was so vital to the plot of Eye of the North. I think it deserves some kind of going back to it instead of just skimming over it as if it didn't really, as if it didn't really happen. Because then it can just feel a bit like a, a cop-out, if you ask me. Anyway, when we come back, Gwen starts speaking. She says, what's that you found? Wait, that's one of Kieran's arrow's heads. He always used to fashion his own. He said they worked better that way. If we use that, maybe the scrying pool can show us what happened. I only hope, but we may need more. I think I have just the thing. I have one of Kieran's bows. God's willing, it will be enough. Come and speak with me when you're ready to take it. So we can... Do we actually have to speak to her? How can I help? Yeah, so you can obtain Kieran's bow from Gwen. And with Kieran's bow, it's a little bit weird here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an actual green item. I, do you get this later? I think you get something similar to this later. I won't talk too much about that. But basically, once you've got Kieran's bow, you can come over to the scrying pool. And we learn that the scrying pool begins to react as you approach. Thoughts of the arrowhead fixed firmly in your mind. And we can use the scrying pool once again, which I think is really cool. This is like, oh, by the way, as far as the timeline's concerned, I'm pretty sure this is still the same year as the War in Kryta. We might have jumped forward a year at this point. I know we've definitely jumped forward a year by the time the Winds of Change comes. And Hearts of the North does tie in the winds, into the Winds of Change. It all ties into each other really nicely, actually, which is quite cool. So uh, we can actually look, we can actually ask it to show me the story of the Arrowhead. When we click, oh, okay, we have to equip the bow. So this is a little bit like the bonus mission pack. I've obviously done all the bonus mission pack stuff on my channel. Never really talked about this, though. When you do the bonus mission pack, you have to equip the item. It seems this is how the game mechanically knows that you're actually, actually eligible to enter a mission of some sort. But you can click the scrying pool and uh, ask to see the story of the arrowhead. And it will take us into a unique mission, very much like the bonus mission pack. Check it out. We are Kieran Thackeray.